Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Nick Gowing from uh, BBC World News, and uh, thank you very much indeed for making it here for nine o'clock. As you can see, some people obviously haven't made it yet, but uh, they will come in. But we feel we need to keep going because otherwise uh, we'll overrun into the next sessions. Um, and you've been good enough to get here on time. Let me just tell you that I, I was in Tokyo on uh, Friday. Some of you may have seen it on BBC World News over the weekend. We did a big debate at the IMF World Meeting. Don't worry about it now, but we had an earthquake in the middle of the recording of uh, the, the debate. So I feel we're, we're safe here in Dubai, but it was a moment of uh, 10 seconds of uncertainty when everything began to shake. And uh, maybe we'll make it shake this morning. Um, but in a different way, so thank you very much indeed. This is um, what's billed as a big conversation, and the aim is to keep pushing uh, back and forward on the boundaries and the new uncertainties in the uh, IT business, uh, and particularly the uncertainties on three particular areas about privacy. Now, obviously, things have been discussed already, but let's keep pushing uh, at that area. Secondly, uh, where are global communications going, particularly um, with voice communications and the, the, the way the old model is beginning to look very old and very tired and maybe not sustainable uh, in the coming, not decades, but probably months and years, and what price innovation, the price of everything, the value of everything. Now, this is a conversation, and what I want you to do is look immediately uh, up at those three addresses up there, because um, what I'd like you to feel you can do is actually enter the conversation as we're having it on the platform. And all of you, I can see, one way or the other, have got um, iPhones, iPads, Samsungs, tablets, whatever. Uh, maybe you're communicating with your office, catching up with your emails, but I'd like you to feel that using those addresses up there, whether it's Twitter, email, um, or text, you could contribute an idea or three to me, which I can then keep putting to the panel rather than saying 10 minutes from the end who's got any questions. It works fantastically well, but don't leave it until 10 o'clock because that makes it much more difficult for me. So those addresses will stay up there and uh, 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 we will, uh, Rich over there is uh, curating and harvesting them as they come in. And what it means is I can put them efficiently uh, to the panelists uh, as we go along. And it can generate uh, a, a sense from you that you, your ideas, as you sit there thinking, I'm frustrated by this, you can contribute that as well uh, to the discussion. Now, who do we have uh, on the panel? Klaus Lessinger, who's uh, from the Novartis Foundation for Sustainable uh, Development, professor of sociology at the University of Basel, where he teaches business ethics, corporate social responsibility, as well as human rights and business. Andy Hare, for 10 years, the main regulator uh, in Singapore. But uh, designing and, and, and being very interested in the issue of major policy frameworks in telecoms, in technology, and the postal sectors, and direct hand responsibility on overseeing the regulator's role in a highly recognized and respected Asian economy like Singapore. But how are things changing? And finally, uh, Ali Jaziri, who's head of innovation and technology transfer, the section there of the World Intellectual Property Organization. I've told them no speeches, but they know the three areas that we want to cover. And I've told them not to be polite and always ask me if they can, if they can speak. So do see this. It is a big conversation. Maybe it could be a little bigger because there are quite some empty seats, but do feel that you are part of this as well. Imagine we're down in the well of the floor and we were um, sipping coffee together. See it in that spirit if you can. And for those of you just joining, those three addresses up there, and I've already got some uh, messages and ideas and thoughts which have come through. I've got seven already uh, about the areas that we're going to look at. But let me pick up, first of all, uh, with the framing of the realities that uh, are faced by the um, IT business, particularly old fashioned versus new fashion. Klaus, pick up on that and then Andy and Ali as well and we'll move forward on the other areas shortly. Well, one thing that is obviously bothering me is uh, that um, we seem to live with new big problems, people reading my mail, people uh, monitoring what I buy, where I go, People are collecting data on me, are analyzing it, are selling it to people who are selling products, and I get spams uh, according to what has been analyzed. I find that not the right way. I find that not something I want. I have not been asked uh, uh, 
that somebody is doing that, uh, forget about f selling it. And I find <clears throat> that this is something we ought to talk about because uh, it can also be used in a political way, uh, not only in a commercial way, and then we would be in a world that I wouldn't want to live in. Andy, uh, if, privacy. If, if I could add to that, I, I have to share, Nick, with you a story that happened to me last week, and it was stunning. It really is basically what you, you had said, Klaus. Uh, I opened up my browser, a pop-up ad came up, and it's, it was for an investment firm. And it says, if your portfolio is such and such, <laughs> the stunning part is they were within 3% of the value of my portfolio. And I was worried that tomorrow would I see the same ad and said, by the way, if you had not clicked this, we would have saved you X amount of money because your portfolio went down. So the intrusion, if you will, without, as you say, without my permission into something that I would consider highly personal is, is something that we should be quite alarmed about. And this is not, it's not a singular event. It's not something that concerns me as much as the mere fact that I have not been asked. I have not granted anybody permission to, to delve into that. As I was traveling to Dubai through a major Asian hub airport, I uh, wanted to buy some uh, water, excuse me, I wanted to buy a, a candy bar and a magazine. I didn't realize that this particular vendor was two separate vendors. I could buy the magazine, but if I wanted to buy the candy bar, I had to show my not only boarding pass, but my passport. I did not understand that. I don't understand why I have to share my personal information, birth date, passport number, where I've traveled to, with a concessionaire in an airport that I don't trust. And I think we'll get into that. I okay. think the issue of trust is important. And did you buy the candy bar? I didn't. Because I didn't. you didn't want to hand over your passport? I did not. I was willing to hand over my boarding pass, but not my passport. All right. Ali, your view uh, from intellectual property on this issue of privacy, and already I'm getting quite a lot of points being raised on this. Yes, I believe that uh, they are in the same Microphone, time. please. I believe that there are in the same time opportunities as well as challenges. The opportunities are the fact that you have ubiquitous connectivity, where you have this hyper-connectivity that people have with smartphones, uh, laptops, uh, tablets, uh, gaming devices, uh, and so on. B and uh, you can be connected no wherever you are at any point in time. In the same time, it is true that uh, it is uh, a big challenge in the sense that today uh, we are becoming more and more the chauffeurs of these mobiles, uh, m mobile uh, gadgets that we're carrying on uh, 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 with us. And uh, the vice president of Intel at the time, uh, about a few years ago, had said, David Tenenbaum, Tenenhaus, had said the, that indeed it's becoming uh, a risk that we're becoming uh, less and less needed for data input because the mobiles that uh, the mobile gadgets that we are carrying will do all the jobs that that need to be done in the same time uh, over the recent years we've seen the evolution of the iPhones for example and the iPhones have become so powerful that in a way it's becoming a threat today in fact, uh, Ken Gabriel, the director of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, uh, in, in the United States, had said that these powerful devices, the iPhones, have had so many new options added to them that they're becoming threats, and they're becoming threats to potential terrorists around the world that could be using these gadgets to do the, their... Uh, bad deeds. Right. And of course, for now we know that if you um, download something from iTunes, you don't own it. You only rent it for your life. You can't pass it on to your, to your kids, um, which is a, an interesting discovery. Let me give you some of the questions that are already on the minds of, of those in the audience. Let me pick up some, some of them. Once information is on the web, it's impossible to delete it. Do you have a right to delete or not? Of course you must have a right to delete. I mean, in what society are we living but can in? you do it? This I don't know. I, I just know that if I have a 14-year-old son or girl out of 
that situation and out of context, they are putting something on Facebook or I don't know, on any other social media, and 15 years later, that might be an issue that prevents her or him being hired by a company. Mm -hmm. How now, do you guarantee it's deleted? If you, if you want to delete it, how can you guarantee, how can you know that it has been deleted? The problem is I cannot know. The problem is, and that's, that's, that's the distrust that is developing. Uh, there has been, at least uh, in the newspapers, there has been stories that uh, Google was collecting data and was promising to delete it and did not. So whom am I trusting if it is a private commercial uh, company that might have an incentive not to delete it while I have a personal interest to have it deleted? Andy and Ali, on that issue of deleting. The, uh, I, I strongly support that. A good friend of mine wrote a book that was titled Delete. And the construct of the book was you should have that right. The problem, really getting to Nick's question, is the fact that you can't because the, with, the, with the cost of and the global virability of uh, the communications networks around the world, I can very quickly make a copy. I can make an exact copy of what you just put on that. Uh, I think, though, it's a more complex issue than just saying, I don't like that information that I have on Facebook. I'd like to delete it. Uh, I, I, I'll give you a, a, the context of the complexity, if you will, without going into the complexity. If I've had a parking ticket, 25 years ago, and it still is residual in the internet, if you will, I quite frankly think I have a right to get rid of that. That should not linger forever. On the other hand, suppose I have a criminal record. Uh, certain people should be allowed to see that, but under the context of who should be allowed to see the fact that I have a record. So in one case, if I'm a criminal, then I shouldn't be able to go into some database and say, expunge that record because, quite frankly, uh, society would be hurt. So there's this societal balance that we're having to draw from. In one case, uh, information gets old. In another case, it is. Now, I, th I think a more relevant question could be, how about if I have a picture taken of me and through face recognition technology, somebody identifies it's me. Now, how about if that picture happened to be taken in a bar? And somebody then draws a conclusion about my personal habits because of the association of me and that bar. If I could share with you just a single statistic, which I thought was stunning. This was a story that was written in the New York Times this past uh, March, I believe, that a research study of executive recruiters said 70% of them said have turned down candidates as a direct result of an online search. Mm -hmm have denied candidates the opportunity. Rightly or wrongly, that's a stunning number that 70% are saying that I have gone online, looked at somebody, found Andy here in a bar, he's got a beer in his hand, therefore, possibly, he's got a drinking problem. Mm -hmm. Don't want him. Mm -hmm. So that is a difficult problem, I think, that we have to deal with, is the sorting out that balance between what's, what can be deleted, what can be expunged, more importantly, what rights do I have? Of course, um, it's about behavior as well. And we can all take a view that not posting stuff on Facebook is a good way forward because actually then it's not in the public space. Mm -hmm. So you have to make a decision about whether you want to enter that space. Ali, again, picking up on, we've got a lot of questions, so let's keep the answers reasonably tight. Uh, delete or not, how do you guarantee it? Uh, now it's becoming, of course, uh, an intellectual property issue. Uh, what happens with the, your pictures, your photographs that you have put on uh, Facebook and one day you decide that you don't want to belong to Facebook anymore and you sign off, you, you, you try to del delete all your photographs. But the question is, uh, and it turns out to be the case nowadays, is that uh, these photographs that you have uploaded on Facebook or a site similar to Facebook are the ownership of Facebook itself. So it's becoming now an issue and uh, you have to really look closely at the contracts when uh, you look and you enter into these platforms and see you know, the, the finer detail about what is going to happen with this uh, intellectual property that you upload into these uh, platforms. Another example is uh, uh, you talked uh, earlier on about these uh, photographs that you might be caught of you in a bar. For example, also Street View from Google mm. has uh, also a big issue 
where people are being photographed in certain areas where they are, they are walking or, or driving by. And uh, it's, uh, Street View was uh, invented uh, at Google Zurich uh, uh, Center. And uh, in fact, uh, what they have uh, gone through now, because of all of these intellectual uh, property issues, as well as uh, these concern issues of people being photographed where, where they are. There was they also the unencrypted data they were pulling down off Wi-Fi. Yes, so now yes. they have gone through blurring every single face on Street View maps that, uh, uh, that are being photographed. So you can imagine how, you know, the cost of blurring every single But let me keep pressing face. you. How do you guarantee that if they say they're going to delete it or erase it, that it will have been deleted or erased? Is it possible to get to that point, Klaus? I don't know. <clears throat> technically, it should Does anyone be, know? Te technically, it should be possible. The question is, who has the right to say yes or no? And I want to have that right and not delegate it to somebody else. Do you believe that's achievable? I think so. Andy? I, it, it is. The technology is being considered right now, today, but it's not. And that is actually to wrap, if you will, certain information about yourself. Suppose I, I put my, uh, my birth certificate on the internet. I would wrap that information in such a way that if it was ever shared with anybody else, they would also get the wrapper with it. And the wrapper would have certain conditions with which you can, in fact, look at that. Now, Klaus makes a decision or he asks me, we'd like you, Andy, to delete your birth certificate, no longer needed on the internet. Quite frankly, what would happen to all the people that it had been shared with, they could delete it too. But the pr fundamental problem, I think, with the digital world. I'm not even talking about the internet. I'm talking about the digital world that we've been seeing over the last 15 to 20, 25 years is the fact that we can make perfect copies and share them around the world. Mm. So uh, we ask Facebook to erase such. It's not, there's no guarantee that I may have downloaded that on my PC. I don't know that, that Ali has asked for it to be erased. It's still on my PC. Two years later, I send it back to the internet. But you see, in the pharmaceutical industry, if you buy a drug, you get a 10-page a, a leaflet, package leaflet that tells you the warnings and the indication and the side effects. You won't get that if you go on Facebook or on any of those social media. media. So you buy a package, basically. You buy risks that you are not aware of, and then you are stuck with it, and people say, well, you shouldn't have gone there. And this is, you know, that's, that's intruding my bubble, and that's, that's affecting my, my sovereignty, and that's the problem I have with it. That, Already, and if you've arrived late, there are three addresses up there. If you'd like to contribute, what I want to do is get a lot of ideas into the mix here. It's a great way of harvesting them. Let me give you three or four other ideas which have come up already. The internet world believes you have a right to be anonymous online. Telcos expect to know about your every movement. How can these worlds be reconciled? And should identity management be controlled by the individual or by a third party? Andy. Uh, I, can, I can address from personal experience the second question, which is really the, the role of a telco in this environment. Uh, and I'll share with you a story. Uh, 2000, the year 2000, I, I was the architect of the framework, the competition framework in Singapore. And one of the provisions I was most concerned about was that the incumbent telecom operator uh, had an enormous amount of information, and they shouldn't, from a competition point of view, be able to use that to sell you other things. So in the competition law, there's a plank, cannot use except to provision the service that you've asked for. Quick end to the story is the very first time we had to use that provision, the very, was in a criminal event, had nothing to do with competition. Somebody had gone in, looked at customer information, and stolen it. And so it was a criminal activity that we, in fact, wound up using the competition side. I personally believe the telco knows, and I think this has been shared, far, far, far more information about you than you can even imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, they know your travel habits. Mm -hmm. They know who you're talking to. More importantly, they know how long you're talking to them. They can identify who you're talking to. And that they, listen in. <laughs> and, and then the question becomes is, can you keep that within the province of providing you a service, mm. not to have them turn around and monetize it and sell it to somebody else mm. who will sell you securities or sell you toothpaste or whatever. Mm. 
Uh, Andy, let me press you that. I mean, you were involved as regulator in Singapore. Yes. And Singapore has a certain attitude to yes. free information or non-free information yes. and the yeah. media and so on. What kind of constraint was there on privacy which was embedded in the licenses, which you talk about the telcos having that information, where there's an expectation from governments that they will get that information too? Good question. Uh, the, uh, so what's uh, the answer? The, li <laughs> the licensing uh, privileges, if you will, that I had towards our licensee was that the government had the right to get access to that information. And that right was a lot broader than one might suspect. Uh, so in other words, unconditional. Without, with, yes, without court order. It's not like many European countries where you would need to go to the court to actually get access to certain information. The government had certain rights to actually get access to that information. And did they exercise that frequently? That I don't know, you know, because that was done. Is there any log of that kind of thing? I, I, uh, it was actually done, I used to call it the black box, that it was done elsewhere within the government. Uh, I was the economic regulator, so I, my job was the health of the market. So if something was happening with the infrastructure, the switches and the data that was going, that was held. That was done Come on, but human history shows that if there is a right to have access, that the access is taken. Oh, I could always assume that. I would always Ali, assume. where does this leave intellectual property, the right of me to me retain the right to whatever is, is known about me? Well, it's, uh, I think, an issue about who you are. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, at the recent summit in Guadalajara from uh, it's an ITU summit on looking at satellite images and uh, looking at uh, sens sensitive sites that people want to protect, um, in, in the United States, you have a lot of sensitive sites that are blurred uh, because of uh, national security issues. But in other parts of the world, some, some sensitive sites are not blurred. So uh, in this ITU summit in Guadalajara in Mexico, there was uh, a big discussion about uh, the right to protect certain information that are yours and that you don't want to disclose or you don't want people And what to... was the outcome of that? There's a right to it, but how do you then exercise it? It was a great success, in fact. It was, uh, uh, there was a recommendations that were put forward to uh, pressure the uh, satellite imagery database to uh, uh, blur certain parts of uh, uh, facilities that uh, certain countries uh, prefer not to disclose to all the, uh, all the world. Klaus, let me pick up on another point here. Um, is the loss of privacy acceptable for the increase in security, given your work on ethics uh, and that whole area? We now know that criminals or alleged criminals in any case are tracked often by their use of mobile phones. Some of them are dumb enough to use their mobile phones, not realizing how they're going to be tracked. But where is the boundary now between very, very security difficult. and privacy? Very difficult. You see, <clears throat> after Can I it be defined at all? I don't know, that's contextual. After 9-11, the world has changed. In the United States, the Homeland Security is saying that certain things are necessary that 10 years earlier would have been perceived to be totally impossible. So, you know, maybe there is not a general rule. Maybe there is a contextuality that has been looked at. But you see, as, as a private citizen, I have an allergy against somebody looking, reading my mail. And, and, and I think I have a right to have that allergy. And if somebody tells me that uh, for security reasons that I can't make a judgment upon, they have to have rights, then I'm getting alert and I want more transparency and I want to be asked and I want communication on that rather than decision behind my back and upon my head. What a Can Sorry, I just Eddie. jump in one second? Um, one of the things I've learned, I've had the opportunity to work around the world, is that there are cultural differences in almost every yeah. economy. And I think one of the things I took away from Asia is there's a very different paradigm of the relationship of the individual to what I'll call the institution mm -hmm. versus the West, which would actually put the individual more than likely first and the institution second or the organization or the enterprise. And, uh, and I've actually done a fair amount of reading in terms of the Asian paradigm that someone might say that the institution, the government, whatever it happens to be, does have that right 
uh, and I will give up my individual rights, yeah. if you will. And we look at China and Southeast Asia and places like that. I'm not disputing that. You know, if I'm, I, I am aware that in a Confucian culture, the mm. community is more important than the individual. Mm -hmm. But then I'm not living in a Confucian culture. Be it there as it might, it's their right to organize their life around that. It's my right to organize my life in Germany or in Switzerland or where mm. I live. You know, the basic issue is uh, that people are getting used to certain institutional conditions and live with it and keep it normal. And uh, here we have the problem that some four or five big brothers behind everybody's back are kind of deciding things that I want to have a word in instead of being decided upon. Klaus, so you come from Switzerland, and of course there's been a significant change in, in culture on banking security and banking yeah. Yeah. Um, anonymity. Have you noticed a significant change on the ethics and the culture of the status of private information in Switzerland recently? Uh, it, we are in the middle of a very important change. Uh, it has to do with uh, what's, what's your property on, 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 on the data with regard of how much money do you have on the bank, how much money do you earn on the bank, and is that something you should voluntarily tell the financial authorities or should the financial authorities have a right to, to, to get an access to that. In Germany, the financial authorities can have a look at your bank account. In Switzerland, that's only possible if and when there is suspicion that there are criminal acts. Uh, that is a question of... of, uh, of How would you see it shaping up, that argument at the moment, particularly after the due diligence and the banking scandals and who's not paying tax, whether in Switzerland or Liechtenstein? Well, it's, it's part of a, of, a, of a more general trend. Uh, wherever there are bad abuses of a system or bad trespassing of, 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 of good manners, the system as a whole is likely to change. And, and that doesn't make sense to me. I mean, if, if 2 or 3 percent or 5 percent of the people are cheating on their taxes and 95 percent are doing an honest job, why should one change the system because of the 5 percent? That's a very general issue. But let me go one step further. You see, uh, if you talk about the banks and if you have talk, uh, talk about the, the, the changed atmosphere, a lot of what's happening to the Swiss banks and other banks worldwide the discussion has started in the 1990s. There were critical questions on a lot of things that were ignored then by the banks. Uh, there were, with regard to the pharmaceutical industry in the 70s and 80s, there are a lot of questions that were kind of refuted in the sense of we know what we are doing, why are you asking? And these retrospectively were early warning signs of an uneasiness, of a diffuse uneasiness that later on uh, led to a public discussion and to regulatory changes that could have been pre prevented or modified if one would have taken up the early signs, discuss about it, create tra transparency, and explain the complexity that one is working with. We're getting a lot of thoughts from you, which is great on privacy. So what I'm going to do is keep um, funneling them to you, and then we'll move on to innovation mm -hmm. uh, and the other areas we, we plan to do. But let me just read three or four of the, those that have come up. An SMS here. And by the way, if you've arrived late, there are three addresses up there. You can help contribute to the discussion by pushing it forward with what's on your mind as you listen. An SMS here. Who can control the web, Google or a Saddam Hussein, and will it be the same? Do you feel that focused marketing based on our previous choices could begin to restrict our ability to discover totally new things? But these are the two ones I'd like to, you to, 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 to focus on. Stop moaning about invasion of privacy. The service is free and you're not forced to use it, like Google. And also, no one reads the small print of contracts over who controls the data. Isn't this just a case of unethical treatment by companies? Ali. Yes, indeed. I think that uh, in the same time, uh, it, these are all challenges, but maybe to build a bridge onto the, the follow-on conversation on innovation, there's immense number of opportunities about uh, the information that is present on the web. For example, LinkedIn gives information on people around the world that, and the uh, uh, expertise that they have around the world. So today, especially in the area of innovation, uh, it doesn't matter what you know. What matters today is to know who knows how. And mm. this is why uh, the uh, Sun Microsystems uh, Joy's Law 
uh, that used to say, um, no matter who you are, you will never be able to hire the smartest people from around the world. And this is true because of the way innovation is moving today. Innovation is moving more and more towards open innovation or networked innovation. Mm -hmm. And thanks to this information that's present on the web, you can literally create a team by finding the perfect person for a particular project and essentially uh, have a, uh, uh, a team that's built from people around the world that are uh, contributing positively and to your project. So in a sense, I think this is quite a, a huge opportunity for especially in the area of innovation. But let me press you on. No one reads the small print of contracts. I've just logged into the IBIS next door. You don't bother to read the long thing. You say, I agree. You don't know what you're signing away because you want to get online. Okay. Is this really a serious challenge, Andy? Uh, it's an interesting point because there was a wonderful case that came out of the California Supreme Court which addresses specifically the, the, the law of unequal bargaining power. Mm -hmm. When Nick checked into this hotel, he was at a disadvantage. He had to go to that hotel. He was clear, and nor did he have the time to read a long agreement. But the wonderful thing about this decision, it was, I think it was about two years ago, and Coincidentally, it was a telco. It was a, a mobile operator, it was a California mobile, mobile operator that actually had a very, very long contract. And the consumer won in that case, actually said because of the unequal bargaining position. And did that have any impact on telcos? I didn't see any after that. Contracts didn't get clearer or shorter mm -hmm. as a direct result, which is really a pity because you would hope a, a court decision, especially a major court decision, would have changed behavior a bit. Uh, if I could just add one other point to, Nick, your first point that came in as a question, which is, can you control the internet? Uh, unfortunately- Who can control the web, Google or a Saddam Hussein, and will it be the same? Well, the, 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 the sad part about it is the internet wasn't ever developed that way 30, 40 years ago. It was developed uh, in the periphery, if you will. It wasn't the traditional, we tend to think of it as a traditional communication vehicle of me communicating with Alec, what's not. We are all at the edge, if you will. Can you control the edge? Of course not. Uh, the problem is there are many, many networks at the edge that you could never get a sight on. If I bring back uh, Singapore into the mix, uh, I, I always thought this was a bit novel and I knew from a policy point of view, why this was done. Singapore blocked 100 websites. Well, I, I When know, was that? The, uh, this was probably about 15 years ago, and they're still blocked. You cannot get to- Do you 100. know how many are number blocked in Singapore at the moment? Uh, 100, they're 100. Only 100 now? They're only 100. But it would be what you might suspect, and this you probably have a smile on, it is www.playboy.com or penthouse. whatever. The, oddity of doing something like that is you will never, ever block access. If somebody wants to get access to a contraband website in Singapore, it's technically quite easy to do. You just use a proxy and you get to wherever you want to get to. Same is true with China. China also does blocking at certain parts of their network. But when you realistically look at how the internet works, and this I hope gets back to the answer of that question, who controls the internet? Quite frankly, sadly, no one does, or we all do. And although that's a very ambiguous answer to it, it's just the way the internet is designed. It's very, very difficult to say, I want to be able to shut you off from being able to get that information. Can't but you see, that, that in a way, that's the ambiguity we have to live with anyhow. I mean, nobody in the room would probably worry if we would block all the pornographic websites, you know, get away with it, nobody needs that. Mm -hmm. But maybe it would be a different thing if we say Amnesty International or, or Greenpeace, I don't know what. So we will have to live with that, and at the end, it's also the personal responsibility of people to use something or not. But the point that you made earlier is uh, that uh, it is a free service if you use Google, and then uh, if you buy uh, using this free service, you can't get of a rucksack of things, whether you like it or not, you don't have to use Google. I find this, 
I f take issue at this view. On the one hand, yes, of course, I do not have to use Google uh, uh, if I do not want to be confronted with other things. On the other hand, if I were Google, I would carefully listen to what's the criticism that's coming. I would kind of look what are my stakeholders, what are my customers interested in, where do they see a problem, and how can I anticipate uh, criticism like this? Because uh, Google had a very successful story uh, in the past years, you know. In the next 10 years, also for Google, the game is changing. And if you want a sustainable success, and if you want to be looked upon as a part of the solution and not as a part of the problem, you ought to take criticism serious, you ought to listen and to learn, and you ought to adapt and not say, you know, it's your choice to use it or not. Right, we've got 25 minutes to run, because we're gonna to run to 10.15, and we've got two other areas we're gonna talk about, about, about the, the new structures and the new models, and the old models, and also price. But what I'd like to do is just do a, a quick round robin because what I'd like to, we've got a lot of contributions here on privacy uh, and it's more efficient than asking you to ask it with a microphone. Let me just give you some of them now so you can respond to any of them. Um, here's uh, Amy Tahar, a Canadian lawyer. Don't we have to start by defining the difference between personal data protection and privacy? Uh, this is from someone no name. Many countries like China and Iran impose censorship on their citizens, access to sites that are perceived as a threat to society or security. Does a government ever have a right to impose censorship on citizens? Let me just keep going, which is an email. Uh, who should finally decide which data should be stored and which data should be deleted? Should there be a free trade for data so that no matter where it resides in the cloud, the same regulations are, are applied? And I've got a couple more if I can get up there in time. Um, older people are concerned about privacy, but young people are not. Are they being naive, or do we have to accept that the world has changed? We've had about 20 interventions already on privacy. Mm -hmm. Anything you'd like to pick out on that before we move on? Andy. Quick, quick, quick on the, um, on the demographics, because that's something we did study carefully uh, in developing the privacy policy. You mean old versus young? Is that yes, what yes, the, 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 the mix of, uh, and, and time and again, I was approached by a young person and said, you're just out of date, you're, you're old, you don't understand, we don't care, quite frankly, we don't care. I go back to my earlier point of profiling, uh, which said uh, that if I lo lost a job, if I didn't, I was denied a, a credit because somebody profiled my interests that I might have had on Facebook against borrowing habits and patterns of people with like interests, uh, all of a sudden I start losing some of the benefits that society offers. I think, quite frankly, the young will change their mind. I think they will recognize that, uh, and to, to quote a, uh, a wonderful quote, and I think it was in the mid-90s, 96, it was the CEO of Sun Microsystems before the US Congress, and he said, if you think you have privacy or data protection, forget it. And he said this to a congressional panel. And it was so true, but this was in 1996. So a long time ago, the people that were designing these systems knew quite well that there are mechanisms that are available in the technology to even track. I think you had mentioned earlier, somebody said, why not just not use it, turn it off? Well, you still don't have that control to the extent you have a mobile phone. I think you have mentioned that, and, and Nick, you mentioned that too, walking around. We know, somebody knows what you're doing. Somebody knows where you are. And if you're visiting your secret girlfriend's apartment, somebody knows that. And that is frightening when you stop. Who to think knows of it. that? But who knows it's the your, who knows it's your girlfriend's apartment? Well, they can associate the two. <laughs> but the point, the no, point. Ser seriously, Andy, yeah, I mean, who knows what you're doing when you go to a certain location? Well, only you know it. That's the point. It's somebody, and, and I think this is the thing that bothers me the most, and I think Klaus hit on this, is the fact that people make interpretations. They make, they make, they make a guess. Mm -hmm. They said, there's an address. We know this apartment is filled with, uh, you know, single women or yada yada whatever, and now I've made a, I've made an assumption. 
about this person, yeah. which is dangerous. It may not be true at all. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, you know, like uh, Ken Gabriel from DARPA had said, the iPhones today are becoming so powerful. In fact, with the GPS technology, you can find out exactly where you're at at any given time. But again, I think uh, there are also opportunities with uh, having these GPS coordinates, especially, for example, here in Dubai, and we are in Dubai today. Um, it's um, uh, a technology that's used, for example, for meeting somebody. You give them the GPS coordinates, and then uh, just you follow your iPhone, and then you can find the particular person. But Ali, keep focused on the privacy issues, can you? Uh, on, on who has the right to know that? Who has the right to know that information, which you're, which you're saying is a benefit? Uh, yes. Uh, OK, so in the same time, uh, if there are conflict about this uh, information, uh, for example, uh, you have a uh, certain, uh, you come up with, uh, with an idea of a given product, for example, and then somebody on the internet creates a domain name with a particular uh, uh, product that uh, you've come out with. Now, in fact, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization has a uh, conflict uh, resolution or domain name resolution for a particular uh, name that uh, you would like to have that somebody else has on the internet. So in that case, it's a, uh, a very useful tool where uh, within 60 days, and uh, I believe only $3,000, you can uh, re retain that name that somebody else has uh, already registered for a particular name that, or trademark that you would like to use for your particular Okay, Ali, thanks, yeah. Uh, quickly, let, Klaus, because no, no, we're, no, we're no, going to run out of time. Okay. We've got 20 minutes to run, but a lot of other issues to raise. Yeah, the point is we have to live with a certain ambivalence anyhow. Everything that can be used to good can be used for, for bad purposes as well. And uh, we discussed, you know, there are certain data that the state is likely to have, be it financial, if you are a criminal, be it for that one. But there are certain data that are private, and they are private means private, and means it's me, and I should have a right to determine, or at least I should be informed of what's happening with that. And, you know, we should not take for granted, well, it's complex and it's difficult, Jesus, it's my data, and I have my rights, and I can, I can visit any apartment, and I can play check there instead of doing some what other people's fantasy might arise yeah. about. The fact that I have to worry about tells me something is wrong in this area. So let's create transparency, let's talk about it, let's get the best brains together, and let's find an optimal solution with which we all can live. The fact that it's ambivalent will not be removed, but if you have a right to your own data, then I have a right to exercise it, and I do not want to mind anybody else's business. Let's move on. We've got 20 minutes to run, and we want to talk about um, innovation and pricing, and also the new models emerging, particularly with uh, VOIP and uh, over the top, and what else is happening in the market now. Ali, your, your view, the particular contribution that you wanted to make, particularly on IPR. Today, we're living in a world where we are seeing uh, changing paradigms of innovation in the same time changing centers of balance of innovation, where centers of balance are shifting eastward towards Asia. And the, the changing paradigms of innovation are quite obvious. In the 19th century, innovation used to be the work of individuals. You had uh, people like, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, people like Edison working in their, uh, in the, uh, uh, in their labs and, and finding solutions to, to particular problems. In the late 20th century, you started having innovation as being the work of large teams. You had the works of uh, Lucent, IBM, DuPont. You had extremely large uh, mega teams that were forming with a lot of uh, funds that needed to be invested for to run these teams. In the beginning of the 21st century, innovation is becoming more the work of networks. So it's becoming a networked innovation, and uh, particularly in the context of the international economic and financial crisis, networked innovation is becoming a real opportunity today. 
innovation is the way out of the crisis, oftentimes. And in fact, today, especially thanks to open innovation, which can be literally defined as the osmosis or reverse osmosis of knowledge across the interface between an organization and its environment. Osmosis of knowledge, which means flow of knowledge, that you have flow of knowledge from individual organization to outside and also in, inward flow from outside to inside. And what are the opportunity in here is that, in a sense, if the organization that's across the street from you is having a particular product that you could insert within your product line, why reinvent the wheel? Why uh, have an entire mega team doing research on this particular product when you can just license in that particular uh, product uh, from your neighbor across the street? In the same time, if you have certain products within your organization, within your uh, company that is not central to the company's business strategy, why not license out this particular product. So I think today we're coming to a point where networked innovation has real opportunities, especially for setting up what we call the global innovation grid. In a way, the global innovation grid is a grid where you can put together teams, as I said before, where you could select and cherry pick the particular person that can give you the right answer for your particular problem. And in fact, open innovation marketplaces around the world are doing exactly that. Innocentive and other, comp other organizations are open innovation marketplaces or eBay's of innovation where you have seekers and solvers of technology. In fact, Innocentive has 50% of their solvers that come from three countries, Russia, India, and China. And this is because of the high skills, high problem-solving skills for, from uh, okay. these co countries. Ali, let me, let me just jump in at that point and just push you a bit further, all three of you, <coughs> um, uh, Klaus and Andy, uh, particularly on the issue of who keeps control of innovation. In other words, there are a lot of predators out there in the market who are prepared to copy and move forward and capitalize. How do you keep control on that, particularly from the gaffer who've uh, innovated like crazy, often at the expense of stability and other concerns for policy? I'm just trying to work out where, how you create a new kind of regulatory landscape, if at all, or is that all over? Well, again, there are, there are resemblances to the pharmaceutical industry. On the one hand, you need a patent to protect your intellectual property because that gives you the revenue uh, that keeps you innovating. On the other hand, the fact that you have a patent restricts access of people to that knowledge. And uh, the question for me is not patent yes or no. The, patent, the, the, the question for me is from a corporate responsibility point of view, what is a responsible use of a patent? Where? you know, where, where is the limit of what is my short-term financial interest with regard to where is a desirable social impact on a broader base. And they are, uh, we go into differential pricing, there we go into innovative models, there we go into partnering, into sharing, and you know, there might be particular, uh, there might be specificities for particular industries, but the basic issue can never be, should we protect intellectual property or not, because we would kind of curb innovation, and that's not desirable in itself. Andy. In, in, yeah. I, oh, sorry, I, I, so, I gonna, Ali, do you want to come back? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Ali, come back. Uh, yeah, just maybe one uh, sentence by saying that intellectual property indeed in the past, uh, well, IP itself, in the past was considered as intellectual property. And now today, more and more, IP is becoming more and more like intellectual partnering or intellectual yeah, yeah. partnership. Yeah. So in a way, IP is becoming the uh, way to exchange the currency that can be used to exchange certain ideas and yeah. certain technologies. Yeah. With partnering, leaders. does everyone retain their rights to be able to capitalize it on it and monetize it and secure their rights in the medium to long term or not? Does partnership mean that now, IP? Well, it turns out that uh, the, it's becoming 
more and more a big issue today because more and more people talk with each other, more and more people engage with each other. So now it's becoming a question uh, of, uh, uh, you know, how much intellectual property or how much can you share with a particular uh, partner that you would like to engage in. You have foreground IP, background IP, and, and uh, you know, it's becoming an issue today about uh, uh, who is, how much uh, uh, information can you share before you engage with a particular person. In fact, there was a uh, census, a survey uh, that was conducted uh, recently by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, OACD that looked at what is the highest risk for open innovation today. And it surveyed 300 top world executives around the world. And it turns out the number one highest risk, 67% of the respondents said the highest risk for open innovation today is IP theft. And indeed, I think today we need tools and uh, in the World Intellectual Property Organization is developing guides and tools specifically to strategically manage open innovation networks. Let me pick up, Andy, before you uh, give, give me your thoughts. Uh, three contributions from the floor here. Uh, firstly, uh, an SMS, does the dominance of companies like Apple and Microsoft suppress information? If a company like Apple can be allowed to bully its competitors when they bring competing products to consumers, then innovation will only be driven by a single vision. Secondly, um, a text here for artists, musicians, filmmakers, digital transfer has almost destroyed traditional models. How can we ensure sustainability for them? And thirdly, Traditionally, patents have been used to inspire and drive innovation. Today, companies are harvesting patent portfolios and using them as weapons against their competitors. Is this a use of IPR? Can I take, I'll take the first one because it was something for a long time, this was the, the Apple control, if you will, of a market. It was something that was very important to me. Uh, and backing up a second, my job in Singapore was just to maintain the health of a market. It, was, it happened to be the communications market, but it was the health and the vibrancy of that particular market. And one of the things that we uh, prohibited by license uh, from all operators in our market was to lock the phone to the service. Uh, and I felt very strongly about the fact that they were two totally separate markets. One is a service provision market, one is a handset market. And I think in the last five, six years, we've seen that the handset market is very, very different than what it was back in 2005 or 2004, just in terms of the capabilities. I mean, we're, we're not carrying phones anymore, we're carrying cameras and we're carrying recorders, in our, but just happen to have a phone in it. Now, the, the economic benefit to the market is that you're, you're treating the service more as a commodity. I probably got more pushback on that policy decision from the service providers, because if I can borrow a, uh, a wonderful term from a, a policy officer that used to work for me, and she once said, it is renting market power. So Apple comes into the market, strong, good product, but why should I be forced to take a particular service provider? I've paid for that phone. I should be able to use that phone with any service provider I want. And the flip is true. The fact that if I have this service from this service provider, I should be able to choose any phone I want. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask, add to both Allie and Klaus's comment, uh, Klaus had mentioned the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, one of the paradigms that we went through in the telecom space, and some of you may remember it, back in the early to mid-90s, was the concept of the walled garden. This was actually taking intellectual property and saying, if you want my content, you must get it from me. So it was the concept of I create this walled garden and it worked reasonably well, and the model that always comes to my mind is uh, an outfit called AOL in the United States, uh, but we all saw what happened to AOL. The wall garden will only live just so long. I know that wasn't Klaus's point, because he was more talking about the protection of my intellectual property through a patent mechanism. But as a competition authority, if you will, I tend to look at a patent 
as being the granting rights of a monopoly. I grant you monopoly rights for X amount of years, which is the length of your patent. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a competition person responsible for the health of the market, I would probably not want that. I don't want to have walled gardens. Okay, okay Andy. Uh, I'm going to have time is beating us, but there's a lot of other stuff I want to try and get through. Just picking up, Klaus, on any of those points that I made on IPR that have come through. Well, look back. Because where I did, can offer you a couple of others. Where if did innovation happen over the past 50 years? It happened where you had intellectual property protected. Well, so, there's one question here on SMS. How does open source fit with innovation? I don't know. You know, I, I'm, I, uh, there are, oh, that's also an, an ambivalence. My experience has been open source that might open new, new, new ways that might open, you know, uh, alternative ways of, of solving a problem. But then the maintenance of, of that channel is not necessarily guaranteed because there is no commercial interest in doing things like this. So. Ali, let me come back to you because there's an email here picking up on the point you were making from Tom Levine from Allen and Overy here in Dubai. If Ali Jazeera's view that inventions and innovation are becoming the product of networks rather than the individual inventors, how does this undermine the framework for legal protection of intellectual property that the WIPO is based on? If there's no inventor and therefore no owner, how will it get economic reward? Mm -hmm. That's uh, a very good question. In fact, uh, in the, uh, especially in the context of open innovation marketplaces, uh, where you have a particular invention that you, ha that you have developed, and uh, the, you're a problem solver, and you propose this uh, as the problem of a particular challenge that was posted in this open innovation marketplace, now, what happens with your intellectual property? In fact, it turns out in these uh, uh, open innovation marketplaces that if you had a particular piece of intellectual property and that was patented, for example, then you can transfer the rights of this patent to this open innovation marketplace and the company uh, will uh, pay you a small amount for that particular uh, solution that you've uh, brought. On the other hand, if you did not protect this particular solution that you're proposing in this open innovation marketplace, then you're also transferring the rights to this solution. In both cases, what happens is that you're transferring the solution of a problem on this uh, uh, open innovation marketplace and receiving an award that can range between five and $10,000. Now, the big question is, is this five or ten thousand uh, dollars that a particular person, a problem solver, receives for a particular solution, the right amount that he should be receiving for the solution that he has proposed? And it turns out that a lot of times, if you had a patent and you had licensed the patent to that particular company that needed that solution, you probably would have had a much higher amount for that particular okay, solution. Okay, Ali, thank you. Um, I've got four minutes to run, and I just want to get to the, the issue which we hope to get to, but we've had such a rich discussion with an enormous number of contributions about the days of the telco being over. Uh, welcome to the world of GAFA. Uh, quickly, uh, particularly, Klaus, your, your experience from the pharmaceutical business about how those who have successful models are not savvy and smart and sensitive enough about how vulnerable they suddenly become. Well, I think if you read the press on, on GAFA, uh, then the writing at the wall, they are definite, there is an uneasiness, there is a lack of trust, there is something that is rising, and I have the feeling that uh, the GAFAs, these big companies, it's, they have been so successful, there's complacency, there's egotism, there's arrogance, who are they to criticize us? And the message from the pharmaceutical business? The message is, these are early warning signs, Talk to your stakeholders, take this criticism serious, try to solve the problem inclusively with these people rather than send the lawyers and hope that you can win the battle. Andy? I think it's, and I said this in the beginning of the session here, I think it's absolutely vital to build trust. And I. Trust don't, between who and who? Actually, it's between the consumer and their, whoever their provider happens yes. to be. And in my mind, it's always the. The, how they're accessing whatever this, it could be a telecom company. So the trust has to be, if I'm going to participate, 
with one of the GAFA organizations? Do I have the trust in my provider to share that information? And then will it get passed on and be used properly? But what do you put, how do you describe the dilemma? All of us expect it to be there, the telco to be providing us with a circuit like that, yet we want to use it as cheaply as possible. Mm -hmm. So who is the trust between the telco to provide a service at the cheapest possible rate, and then you say you Skype or whatever, mm -hmm. and you are paying almost nothing for the use of this? Who's well, the trust deal with? The, the trust in my mind has always been with the access provider, which is the telco. And the fact that I am not going to be manipulated in some fashion. Uh, I'm not going to be denied access. You mentioned Skype. I'm not going to be denied access to Skype. Uh, if I am in a hotel and I'm using the telco to get to Skype, the hotel doesn't interfere or the telco doesn't I interfere with my right to get to any device I want to get to. I think it's terribly important, uh, and it's a, it's a policy concept, of any to any. Any device ought to be able to get to any other device or any other site anywhere. Klaus, do you believe behaviorally, after what the pharmaceutical business went through, which you know so well, do you think behaviorally the big telcos understand the enormity of what they face, not in no. 10 years, but yes. maybe 10 months? No. I have the feeling there's uh, still there's too much complacency. There's too oh, too much. It worked in the past. Why shouldn't it work in the in, in the future? There is a lack of opening up and of and the ability to to look at themselves from an outside perspective, and that has always been leading to more problems and not to less problems. Ali, I believe that um, we should look more and more closely about what is happening, especially in the developing world. Uh, in the developing world, there are immense number of new technologies that are being used that in our developed world, quote unquote, have not even conceived. Uh, just give you a couple examples. In Kenya, for example, in Africa, there, the M-Pesa mobile uh, payment uh, approach uh, through just an SMS uh, messaging system or the Ushahidi uh, experience, which uh, is an extremely powerful experience using your mobile phone and to uh, uh, using a mapping uh, a way to uh, track a crisis. For example, if you have an earthquake or you have a, 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 a mob uh, a, a kind of crisis, through this SMS messaging system, the Ushahidi can really track where a particular crisis is located on a given map geographically in a particular thank situation. You. Okay, Ali, thank you. I can see people are beginning to think it's time to move to the next session. Let me offer you, there's one uh, great comment here on email. I don't have a Facebook account. It's come from someone in the room, no name. I don't have a Facebook account. However, my friends have posted pictures of my new IKEA kitchen, while another emailed my Gmail account asking how the installation was going. Now I'm receiving ads on construction material. Yeah. Isn't this an invasion of my privacy? And finally, um, uh, what number am I looking for? Number 11, yeah. What do you most fear and what do you most hope for our future in the cyber world? That's from a regulator in Vanuatu. Quickly, 10 seconds, Andy. <laughs> uh, I think my biggest fear is that there still is innovation in the telecom space. I think it's, it's one that is... Uh, uh, it's under a lot of threat, threat right now. I've always been concerned that the major telco, telcos around the world uh, somewhat come from the same model that think uh, the old I get everything still works. And unfortunately, the sharing model has become more the order of the day. Thank you. Klaus. I think the huge potential of this industry could be curbed by trust, uh, by distrust developing by uneasiness development, by forcing upon a regulation that might prevent more good than it is preventing harm. Ali, final word, can you see trust as being something which can survive or distrust? I believe that there's a one key word, learning to behave. And nowadays, learning to behave is a key characteristic about identifying a particular uh, partner. So in a way, in the, in the culture, in the society that we live in, the hyper-connected society, if we don't behave, then immediately we're on the sidelines. 
Ali, Andy, and Klaus, thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope you felt it's been a rich discussion. We had about 30 interventions from the floor, which certainly is about, probably about um, uh, 10 times more than we would have otherwise with microphones and so on. I hope you felt it's been worth it. But thank you very much for entering the spirit of having a big conversation. And maybe we can have a conversation which lasts a little bit longer next time, because actually there was a very rich series of veins which you were generating from the floor as well. So thank you very much indeed. And thank you for being patient as I've let it run over. Thanks. Thank you.